And um, we're just delighted today to have our sister Liz Theo Harris, the Reverend Dr. Liz Theo Harris with us uh, uh, from New York City, um, where, she, where she's with her family. And uh, in, in her uh, professional role there, she directs the Kairos Center at uh, Union Seminary. Uh, she is also a co-chair of the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral revival, which we're delighted to be part of with her. And um, we're so glad to have you this morning, Liz, because uh, in addition to all that work, you have also been a serious scholar of the Jubilee and a serious preacher of God's economy in this world. So um, I, I thought I would start just by asking, how did you come to be so interested and devoted to this issue of God's economy and what it means for all of us? Well, it's so great to be here uh, in prayer with you all as we we welcome 2000. And 21, um, which uh, looks like it won't be an easy year, um, just like the one we just finished, but but one hopefully where we'll bring in some more justice. Um, yes, and uh, I, I, in terms of of where my obsession with with the Bible, with God's economy, and with uh, this practice. Uh, that we need oh so much now of Jubilee comes from is, is really uh, going back to, to both the time that Shane and I met 25 years ago um, and even before then, but um, for the past 25 years of my life as I've been engaged in very grassroots anti-poverty organizing, um, me being uh, a part of that work both because of uh, poverty that I've experienced myself and because of um, uh, my, my study of what God wants for all of us in the world. Um, there's barely been a week that goes by where somebody doesn't say that poverty is inevitable. Mm. That if God wanted to end poverty, he mm. would do so. Um, that, that it might be unfortunate that, uh, but that um, the only time we'll, we'll see a place where poverty has been ended is when uh, we die. Um, mm -hmm. And, and that really, you know, both brought me to seminary. Um, um, and it brought me to, to biblical scholarship. I mean, it, it brought me to, to decide that I, I needed to understand better what uh, God, what Jesus really says about poverty. Um, mm -hmm. And, um, and in particular, um, this line that Jesus says, right before he's betrayed and, and, and then executed um, uh, in state-sanctioned violence um, uh, for where, where he says, you know, the poor will be with you always, um, but you will not always have me. Yes, yes. Yeah. And that passage, you know, it, it shows up in John, it shows up in Matthew, and it shows up in Mark. Uh, I think it was so controversial that uh, Luke already took it out um, when he was writing his gospel. Um, uh, I, I, um, cause I think it was already being misinterpreted perhaps. Um, mm -hmm. but it's, a it's a quote, um, it's a reference to the Hebrew scriptures and to the practice of Shemitah, um, release Sabbath economics, um, and mm -hmm. Jubilee. Uh, you know, Walter Brueggemann basically says that Deuteronomy 15, um, which is what, uh, Jesus is quoting when he says the poor will be with you always um, is the most radical and most unknown part of the Bible. Um, mm. And it, it says, you know, uh, if you follow these commandments that I'm giving to you today, if you release slaves, if you forgive debts, if you pay people what they deserve, and if you lend out money knowing full well, you'll never get paid back, uh, that your whole nation will prosper. You'll mm -hmm. never have to borrow. And you'll always live in prosperity and abundance for all, um, mm -hmm. which is exactly opposite of how we think economies are supposed to work, especially if they're going to be prosperous. Um, yeah. mm -hmm. um, but Jesus quotes it and, and doesn't just quote it, but reminds us that this is, this is God's economy that we're called to, to make a reality and that he 
uh, was was bringing into reality, um, mm. and and why he therefore was such a threat, and and he knows he's going to die, and uh, uh, and and says, well, then it's it's all of his followers' duty um, to to enact that jubilee, um, mm. to make it a reality, to sound those uh, ram's horns, um, and to uh, make a sound for justice. Um, and, uh, and, and we still should be working at that today, if, yes. especially if we're followers of Jesus. Yes, indeed. And you know, when, I, when I look at the early church, you know, that's one of the thing that, things that really inspired us, Liz, as we were starting our, our Simple Way community is mm -hmm. when it's, you know, one of the signs that, of what happened to, that the Spirit did among them was not just speaking in tongues. I mean, that's wonderful, but, but it was also that they shared everything radically and that there were no needy persons among them. So when people say the poor will always be with you as a way of uh, sort of just, you know, like kind of taking wind out of your cell to, to do economic justice, mm -hmm. the early church, you know, they were surrounded with poverty. It says that, you know, anytime there were people who had needs, they would bring it before the community. They'd put the offering at the apostles feet and distribute it to folks that had need that. I mean, that was, you know, we, we read that and saw how different that was from, from what most churches do with their offerings. <laughs> you know? And, uh, and that inspired us. And I, I think, you know, that, that but there's, I, I'm interested in you talking a little bit too about there's folks that would say, yeah, that's what the church should be doing. Right. And this is what individuals should do. Like ba Basil the Great is right. You know, that we shouldn't have more than we need while someone has less, but you've also dedicated yourself to the economic justice on the macro scale. So maybe talk about how those interact. Cause I think that's a stretch for some people to think about what the government's role in some of this is and what's the church's role or what's my individual responsibility, my personal responsibility. Well, I think that um, that passage, both from Acts two and from Acts four, right? I mean, this, this, ongoing practice of the early of the early church um, is one that isn't just a practice amongst poor people in the Roman Empire uh, around the year zero or 30 or 50 um, but it also is uh, remembering the Hebrew scriptures and the texts and teachings you know both of manna right where no one can have too little and no one can have too much um, that's set up you know in response to actually, imperial slavery and servitude that is set up because of storehouses and, and, uh, um, and the hoarding um, and the greed of empire. Um, but it's also a reference to you know, that passage in Deuteronomy, one of the most radical passages that none of us really know, um, is, is actually uh, you know, part of the Deuteronomic code. Um, and it's a, it's a, it's a code about what nations, what whole nations are required to do if they're gonna organize around God's commandments, right? Mm -hmm. And so Deuteronomy 15 is very clear that, you know, this is what I'm telling you to do today. And if you follow these commandments, not you as an individual, not you as a group of, of Christians or of Jews, but you as a nation, if if your political leadership follows the commandments that God gives, um, uh, there will be no one in need. Um, there will be no needy person. And mm -hmm. then it continues, you know, that passage that then we get the quote, the poor will be with you always. It basically says, because you're not going to follow my commandments. And again, this isn't just a message for us as individuals. This is a message for the ruling authorities of our society that says that nations that do not follow the way that God has said things should be. It's not yeah. that God made too little. It's not that God created scarcity. What are you saying if you as a, as a Christian political leader says poverty is inevitable? You're saying that God didn't make enough for everyone, right? Um, yeah. and, and it could be true that God did not make enough for everyone to hoard. Um, whether it's the hoarding that happens, you know, in slavery in Egypt, or whether it's the hoarding, you know, of Micah, where where folks are putting house to house, or whether it's the hoarding in Jonah, where where you're crushing the face of the poor, right? I mean, there's there's a lot of 
the instances of ruling authorities legislating evil, as Isaiah says. Um, but there's also a, an equally powerful, a gospel tradition, a biblical tradition of, of enough for all, um, mm. of enough for all, and that that's what God's economy and that's what God's, you know, will and, and, and commandments to all of us is, mm. is, is again, all of us, each of us, we should give to anyone that asks of us. All of us, each of us should, you know, bring whatever we have and lay at the apostles' feet. Um, and we should live in a nation. Um, and then the ruling authorities of our nation should not honor and worship Caesar, but should honor and worship the God who led us out of Egypt, who oh. is always with um, the poor and the oppressed. Um, and, and the struggle for justice. Um, and that that's who we know um, God to be and who we are then to be as God's people. You know, I hear, I meet a lot of people these days who hear this message and they say, whoa, that sounds like good news. But then they say, I've been around some churches and that doesn't sound like what I've heard in church. <laughs> <laughs> so, so so as a as a preacher of this good news where do you direct people when they want to be part of this economy well i mean i think uh just like um the simple way was started as 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 followers uh, as people who were trying to live out god's true vision in the world there are powerful examples of grassroots leaders, especially those um, who are impacted by injustice themselves, who mm -hmm. are, uh, you know, following the, the call of the prophets and of God um, and, and, you know, involving themselves in movements for justice. And so I think, um, you know, so as a biblical scholar and as a preacher, but as a, a scholar, you know, I, I want to direct people right back to those texts because you can look at any of them and even the ones that are used against us all the time. And if you, you read it in, in conversation with the lives that we're living today, and if you put it in its historical context, there's a message of liberation and justice. Um, uh, and, and, and so I, I want people to go back there and, and to know, you know that good news, right? I mean, evangelism, evangelion, right? Is, is never, at least in the Gospel of Matthew, separated from justice and righteousness, right? Mm. You cannot be bringing the gospel. You cannot be bringing the good news if you're not bringing good news to those who have been made poor by injustice. If, you, if, you're, if you're not speaking a word that has hope and not hope that is, you know, uh, there's gonna be pie in the sky when you die, but hope in the here and now, for, for, for God's people, for God's hungry people who are thirsting for justice, right? Um, and and so, so to me, it's so important that we know that when we read these passages, um, that, that we are actually being commanded to, to bring good news to the poor. And what is good news but the ending of poverty, the releasing right. of debts, uh, getting some money in your pockets, being able to be paid wages that can support your whole family, having health care for all, right? I mean, we're, we're clear that there's nowhere in any of our gospels where Jesus, you know, charges lepers a copay. Or he travels around the countryside setting up free health care clinics and, 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 and pulling all of society to do the same, right? It's not just that he's great and we can't be like that. Mm. It's that we're called to do, to have the faith, not just in Jesus, but the faith of Jesus. And what is that faith? But that life doesn't have to be this way and that God commands that all God's people have justice. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I like that uh, you're, you're bringing the fire this morning. I like that, uh, you know, this, this economy of enough uh, we, we talk, that's one of the things we talk about in our little intro to January in common prayer is that one of the themes all through scripture is exactly what you said, that God didn't make too many people or not enough stuff 
uh, I, I quote you sometimes, Reverend Liz, when you say the only scarcity we have is a scarcity of will. Did I get that right? That's right. <laughs> right. That's, there's, that's the scarcity you know. we got in this country and in this world, right? I mean, yeah. and, and, and I mean, we have five abandoned houses for every homeless person in this society. And yet yeah. the city where I live, New York City, spends $3 billion a year keeping people homeless, right? Mm -hmm. It's set up so to spread poverty, to spread injustice, but, but the abundance that God created and that God intends for us to then use us as, again, not just as individuals, but as whole nations is mm. about lifting the load of poverty um, mm. that all may, you know, have enough um, and, and thrive and not just barely survive, as I learned from the welfare rights leaders of, of of the past and of the present. Mm. Well, I know there have been various Jubilee years declared at different times. Uh, I remember 2000 and lots of energy around the Jubilee there. But I'm praying 2021 will be a Jubilee year. And uh, <laughs> I, I know you are too. So I, I wonder just as we imagine what this good news looks like in the here and now, what does it look like for a biblical Jubilee to come in 2021? Right. I mean, so it, it has to be forgiving debts, right? I mean, we live in a nation that is the richest in human history, and yet there's a negative savings rate, right? Mm -hmm. And so that we had our people, 140 million people who are poor or one storm, one healthcare crisis, one job loss, one emergency, and all this year has been as emergencies this past mm -hmm. year, away from economic ruin, right? But yet, what we've seen in this pandemic alone is, is the wealthiest get $1 trillion more dollars, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, a, a number that we literally couldn't start counting from one and get to a trillion and still be alive, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's how, that's how big, that's how great a trillion, even how a big a billion is, let alone a trillion. So, so, we, so what Jubilee in, in 2021 needs to be is forgiving debts. Uh, mm -hmm. Household debt, student debt, car debt, you know, consumer debt, all, all debt. Um, state debt, right? I mean, part of the reason that our states are, are in the position where they're, they're cutting schools and education for our kids and, and putting the money they got into, into to policing is, is because they're having to make hard choices. Um, states are in debt. So we should be forgiven those debts. We should be making sure that everybody... Um, has the health care, has living wages, has, um, and, and these, these aren't just 2021 demands. I mean, this is, these are biblical demands. If you read Deuteronomy, if you read Leviticus, you know, it's that, that the poor should have the right to eat. It's that poor people should be able to have enough to, to rest some days, right? It's, it's, it's that, um, the society should be organized around the needs of those at the bottom. And when you, when you lift from the bottom, everybody can rise, right? And so, so it's not that like now we have these very specific demands around healthcare and living wages and ending debt. Um, those are the same. Those are the same demands as as in the prayer that Jesus teaches us, right? Mm -hmm. Give us this day our daily bread, so that every day we have bread, right? And mm -hmm. forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors, and and lead us not into temptation, not into the trappings of empire, not into thinking that, that I and I alone can do, can do anything. Um, but, but, but instead, we should, we should know that, that all God's children, all God's children, no exception, you know, should be able to live the life that God intended when God created this beautiful abundance um, mm -hmm. where everybody 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 can have all that they need mm. not just to survive but mm. to actually live full abundant lives i have come so that you may have life and have it to the full mm. that's not just a, a nice little pretty saying that is god jesus's mission to this world mm. that all may have abundant life. Abundant life means a good education. It means knowing that when you get old, you're gonna be taken care of. 
knowing when you're young that you are loved and cared for, knowing that our money should not go to bring legions and legions and legions upon different nations and upon the poor of this nation, but, mm. but that actually God intends another way. Mm. 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 Amen. Amen. One of the, the, the things is we think of Jubilee, you know, folks that aren't familiar, you know, with this, this was not, this was a God's order for things, right? As, as the, the enslaved people were liberated from their slavery in Egypt, and God says, now you're going to be a different kind of people. You know, you need to do these things. You need to dismantle inequality, release people from debt, set slaves free, like let the land rest. And uh, our brother Chad Myers says sometimes that people, people say, well, they never did that. And uh, he, he says, well, Christians have never really done the Sermon on the Mount either, but <laughs> that doesn't mean God, it wasn't, you know, God's dream, God's intention, God's command for us. So you sort of think like, what, what would it look like for us to, because we're living in some of the most extreme inequities that we've ever seen since humans existed, right? Between the super rich and super poor. And I think of the story of Zacchaeus too, when he caught the vision of Jesus, he, he encounters Jesus, he's born again, but he's also uh, immediately starts to, to turn the system on its head, repay people. So he did reparations, right? He paid people back four times what he owed them. So I, I, I keep thinking, you know, what does that look like? Because, I mean, we're it, every year, I, I used to quote that 100 people own the same as half the world. And now it's like 50 people or even less than that, right? That own the same amount of resources as half the world. And that's, that's an unsustainable world, right? That, that's a like I, I, I think idealism is thinking that we can continue to live with masses of our world living in poverty while 50 people have more than, than entire countries, right? Yeah, mm. no, I think that's right. And I, and I think it's actually exactly what idolatry is, right? I mean, it, it, it goes worse than just like um, us thinking it's stable. It's, it's actually, it's, it's that which God hates the most is when we as humans think that we are God, that we get to make decisions about who lives and who dies, when we get to hoard up so much resources that it means, that hoarding of resources means that people are gonna starve, right? And, and who gets to make decisions? We surely don't as, as, as earth that comes out of earth and that is breathed into life by God, not by, not by another human, not by a Caesar, not by a president, not by a corporate business owner, but God, God, a God who led us out of Egypt, a God who, who prohibits that we ever worship gold, but instead worship that which created gold in the first place, right? And I think mm. about our brother, you know, Jonathan, that you know so well, Wensler Nosey, and, and the, the leaders at the Apache Stronghold um, in Oak Flat, Arizona, who, who, whose, whose very sacred land, the land that is the Mount Sinai to the Apache people, where God created everything, started everything, is being threatened to be mined by multinational copper mining. Um, and, 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 and Wenzler's response when, when, when the, the corporations come and say, but have you seen these great riches? Mm. Wenzler's like, of course, this is where God started everything. Of yeah. course, this is where beauty and, and richness and, 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 and spirit is. But mm. that's because it's creation for all not for a small number of, of, of greedy hands that mm -hmm. then what, what can you even do um, with this kind of wealth? I mean, you know, mm -hmm. you, you have to think about, you know, James five, the uh, weep and moan, um, you rich people for the misery that is coming upon you. Um, mm -hmm. the, the, the wages you failed to pay your workers are crying out against you. Their mm -hmm. cries have reached our roar in the ears of God, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and you fattened yourself up for the end times, right? I mean, th th these are not, uh, you, you, we, can, we can see what that looks like. I mean, mm. right now we have the world on fire. We have storms wreaking havoc. We have 
pandemics exposing racism and poverty and, and the degra degradation of human life. And, mm. and we have a handful, you know, less than 50, as you're saying, Shane, people who are, are just profiting, who are just engorging themselves and, and getting so rich off of the backs of the misery of the so many. And, mm. and that is, is anathema to God. That, that is um, not because I'm saying so, not because we're having a conversation where, where we all agree and we're saying so, but it's because what the Bible says and what our prophetic leadership that has, has arisen over thousands and thousands of years have called out. Um, mm. So you don't have to listen to me. You don't have to believe me because I'm saying it. Go read the Bible. Go mm -hmm. read, you know, Exodus. Go read Jonah. Go read Ezekiel. Go read Jeremiah because uh, this kind of judgment uh, about the inequities and about the idolatry that is to hoard up wealth uh, uh, when, when people are suffering mm. is... Um, is not the way of God. It's the mm. way of empire and empire. We are, we, are, we are not to be propping up empires if we're people of God. We're supposed to be with God, um, helping to lead a liberation movement. Hallelujah. Yes, indeed. I got a call last week from a man who, uh, here in the community who asked if um, I could help him find um, five people who are, um, uh, you know, essential workers, people who've struggled this year. He said he wanted to um, give them some money anonymously. And I said, okay, I'd be happy to do that. I said, uh, but why do you want to do this? And he said, um, well, I have some money in the stock market and I looked at it and I realized that I had made this money while other people were suffering. And he hmm. said, uh, I don't want to be a part of a system like that. So I figured I'll at least do what I can to redistribute it. And I thought, you know, this system isn't good news for anybody. Hmm. Even the people who, th who are supposed to be profiting from it can, when they look at it honestly, can realize this is a terrible way to live next to your neighbors. Yes. You know, so the, the good news you're preaching really is liberation for all of us even the ones who are supposed to be benefiting realize that there's something just morally wrong about, you know, having an extra cake on your table when somebody else is hungry. Yes. I think this yes. is so true. I mean, when, when, you know, I, I live in New York city. And so when, when times are a little different than right now, uh, you know, I walk on the streets of New York with, mm -hmm. with my kids um, and, you know, my, my kids are very aware of, of justice issues and, and poverty and homelessness. And yet they notice when there are folks living on the streets and especially in this, right? Especially when people are, 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 are hurting so much. Um, and, and even if my kids aren't directly impacted by another person's homelessness in that very moment, um, we're all morally injured by a society that allows any person to go sick mm -hmm. and without health care, any person to live on the streets, right? I mean, and, and I think that this is what's so beautiful about those acts stories, right? Um, it, it, you know, the, the example that you, you started us off with, Shane, of, of, of um, any who had, had resources came and laid them at the apostles' feet. And then what I love about that Acts 4 text so much is then it, it names a person. It says there was Peter, who his friends called Barnabas, um, who, had a, who owned a plot of land. And, and he sold it, and he brought it and laid it. And, and to me, it's, it's an example of, of this really happens. This is really true. And guess what? That Barnabas, that son of encouragement, was encouraged by mm -hmm. participating in a society where he and everyone else around him got to have enough and nobody had too little, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, yeah. and I think that that just happens over and over again in our biblical stories, and it happens over again in our, in our lives today, um, where, where we actually all are, are both morally um, uh, lifted up um and but then also materially lifted up when 
we organize society in a different way. Um, and, and we actually listen to God's uh, teachings and commandments. It's good. One of the things that occurs to me as I, I was thinking on that with you, Liz, was uh, that, that sometimes there's this sort of ascetic rejection of all of the things of this world, you know, and this sort of um, uh, vow of poverty, you know, and, and things that's, that folks have done, like St. Francis and a lot of the monastics. And, and yet, um, I think what, what some of us are sort of rethinking in the midst of all this is that it's not that the stuff is, is terrible, but it's that it's so good. We want everybody to get some. And I, you know, I, I don't know if you, uh, when I was in India, I got a kid an ice cream cone and they got so excited. They grabbed all the other kids to make sure they got a lick, you know, <laughs> and I always think of that as like, isn't that the innocence, right? Uh, or I think of the desert monastics, right, John? And they said they got, someone brought them grapes and they were so excited to have grapes because they were like chocolate truffles. They were like a delicacy, right? So they went and they passed them around and they went to all these different clusters of communities and everybody had plucked off just one or two of them, but there were still a bunch of grapes, you know, that were going around. And that's, that's the vision, right? Is that it, it, we, wanna, we, we want everybody to have a warm bed. We want everybody to know how good ice cream tastes. And, and the, the the more that we hoard for ourselves, the more we ensure that not everybody's going to get uh, to, to experience the goodness of the gifts of God, right? So it's, it's a different blessing than just we want poverty or we want this crazy prosperity gospel that if you give a dollar, you'll get a hundred back from God. Uh, but there's a different vision, right? That, that we would all have this day our daily bread. No, I think that's right. And I think, um, you know, I've done a bunch of studying of, of anointing. Um, I mean, in part because uh, that story where um, where Jesus says the poor will be with you always is actually where Jesus is anointed, you know, and and he's anointed as Christ there, right? I mean, he's anointed as the Messiah, and 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 what a Messiah is um, uh, was back then and and is still today is is one who has been set apart by God to organize society around the needs of the poor. Um, and, and the way you're anointed is, is by, you know, a holy anointing oil, a kind of moron is, is, is put on your head. Um, and, uh, and that's it. You're deemed, you know, you're deemed, you're deemed Christ, um, right? You're deemed Messiah. Um, you're, you're, you know, set apart as a prophet or a priest or as, or as, um, as a ruler. Um, and, and there's other anointings that happen as well um, and probably are taking place, you know, kind of simultaneously to, to the anointing of Jesus as, as Christ. Um, and, and, and some of my favorites are ones that come from Isaiah and, and their anointing of the poor. They're about poor people being honored and taken care of with beautiful, rich things, right? Um, and it's, you know, there's uh, these other anointings that are in the Bible that are about, you know, kings having these beautiful burials um, and these beautiful rich cloths, you know, um, and, and luxury. Um, and, but, but, but clearly the, 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 the best ones in the Bible are where poor people are, are, are honored with good things, with beautiful mm -hmm. things, with, with luxurious things, not because, um, they're only luxurious because two people have them or have access to them, but because they're, they're, they're like chocolate or they're like fruit or they're beautiful and, and everybody, everybody, everybody deserves that. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and I think that that is really true in our, in our biblical texts is that there are places in our Bible where the poor deserve the very best. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and it's, it's, it's the Magnificat, right? It's the, 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 the hungry are filled with good things mm. um, and they're lifted up and, and they're not, you know, it's not just the donated cheese or it's not just mm. the, the, the things that you want to give from your pantry in a, in a, in a um, canned drive. Um, it's good things, right? Mm. It's, it's, um, it's what you, what everybody wants, you know, it's, 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 it's your Christmas, you know, delicacy it's your it and 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 this is really important this is actually a part of jubilee right um you know uh it, it's very clear in deuteronomy it's very clear in leviticus and and the, in the 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 larger codes that that it's not just about the poor scraping by it's about everybody deserving good things 
mm. you know, beautiful things, abundant things, rich mm. things, luxurious things. Now, uh, it, it turns the head on um, if luxury means that only a couple people can have it, you know, and, and, and we're clear, you know, in, in books like Revelation that, um, that luxury items that are sold on the same market as the bodies and souls of human beings are not good things, right? Mm -hmm. but, um, but, but there is beauty and there is abundance and, there's, and everybody gets it. Um, mm -hmm. not, not some, um, and, and, and everybody deserves it, but especially starting with the poor. You know, and that, that's, that's what the Bible says. Um, and, and so, you know, I think we should, we should live our lives, you know, uh, remembering that. Um, yes, hallelujah. Well, this is a wonderful prayer. You know, prayer is conversation with God. It's also conversation with one another. And somebody who has listened to the words of scripture as faithfully as you have, Sister Lee, it's just a prayer to talk to you. So yep. thank you so much. We, we always wrap up our prayer with the Our Father, so let's pray together. You've already been prayed it, but we'll, we'll pray it in, together in unison. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Lord, help us answer your call as readily as our father Abram, that we might extend your blessings throughout our community. Remind us that the places where we find you become altars in our world. Amen. <laughs>